please try and use this. Uh, um, so yeah, to introduce our two speakers from uh, the Virginia Department of Transportation, we have Lauren Mollerup. Uh, Lauren Mollerup is the Northern, uh, the VDOT Northern Virginia District Maintenance Engineer. She currently oversees interstate primary and secondary roadway maintenance assets, as well as the infrastructure, uh, structure and bridge and equipment teams across the district. Over the past 15 years at VDOT, she has worked collaboratively and across functional areas with various internal and external stakeholders to resolve a variety of transportation challenges. Might explain why she's here today. Um, a few positions she has held include the transportation engineer in location and design, area construction engineer, uh, overseeing maintenance construction projects, and transportation and land use director for Fairfax and Arlington counties. Uh, Lauren received her master's degree from George Mason University in transportation policy, operations and logistics, and a bachelor's degree in civil engineering from Virginia Tech. And she'll be co-presenting with Marion Carroll. Uh, Marion Carroll is the NIPTES coordinator at the VDOT Northern Virginia District Office. Marion serves as a technical resource and a point of contact to assist the district office meet the agency's municipal separate storm sewer or MS4 program goals. Prior to her work at VDOT, Marion worked as an environmental specialist at the Virginia Department of Environmental Quality, the Virginia Department of Conservation and Recreation, and KBR Halliburton. Marion holds a master's degree in environmental science from American University and a bachelor's degree in German and environmental studies from William and Mary. So, Lauren and Marion, if you could please come up. Yeah, if you could just talk into that. Is it how you please? Sure. Thank you very much. Yeah. And I control it up here, I guess. Uh, yeah. Clicker. Uh, clicker here. Should okay. Address you at all. Make it full screen. Okay. All right. I'll just. Okay, good morning everybody. This is really truly a lovely facility. I've never been here before, um, but it is really nice and I was interested in hearing um, more about it. So I'm Lauren Mollerup. I'm the District Maintenance Engineer for Northern Virginia. Um, you heard that through the introduction and I'm here to talk to you about how VDOT does uh, winter weather and specifically snow removal and answer any questions that you might have. So um, I've got a lot of pictures because I feel like you guys are going to have a lot of presentations today. So hopefully it'll be um, somewhat entertaining and informative for you. So just, just a general background about our uh, maintenance program. So the district up here in Northern Virginia includes Fairfax, Loudoun, Prince William, and Arlington counties. Um, Arlington maintains mostly its own network of secondary roadways, and we have the primary roadways with the exception of a portion of Columbia Pike. Um, the population is constantly growing. I think it's closer to 2.4 million now versus 2.2 million um, in terms of uh, Northern Virginia as a whole. We've got about 24 commuter lots. Um, we've got over 2,000 bridges and large culverts. We've got about 1,400 traffic signals, and um, we've got you know over 850 VDOT employees in the Northern Virginia District. So there are nine districts in VDOT, just so you all know. Um, okay, total lane miles up here that we're responsible for is close to 14,000. Now that's constantly growing. We're still um, you know an urban district, so Loudoun County is developing pretty heavily right now. Fairfax is still developing, and Prince William, of course, and you know Arlington's um, you know developing within its its network. So we're constantly developing and evolving, and we're inheriting new roadways um, you know every year, hundreds of miles of roadways to maintain every year. And that you can see kind of the the breakup of um, interstate primary secondary. We've got gravel roads. We've got a lot in Loudoun and some Prince William. Um, we've got maybe one or two left in Fairfax. We've got you know frontage roads, those roads you see in front of shopping centers that aren't necessarily part of the mainline railway, but those roads. And um, you know a lot of subdivision streets, a lot of quality stacks, residential neighborhoods, and things like that. We've got 18 maintenance area headquarters in Northern Virginia District. So one in Arlington, nine in Fairfax, four in Loudoun, and four in Prince William. You may be driving through the district and see some of these um, you know, material barns, if you will. They're storage barns. We've also got ones that are circular in nature. Um, we've got a really big one off of 495. That's like a mega, mega dome. You can see it off of, um, off of the roadway there, the interstate there. Um, just and just talking numbers. Last year, our snow budget was last fiscal year 84.8 million. This next fiscal year, it's going to be about 55.4 million. So our budget's, um, you know, been um, 
uh, you know, leveled a bit. Um, we've had a couple light snow seasons um, for snow, obviously public safety, emergency, we're going to do what needs to get done. Um, but we do have a, you know, significantly less snow budget going into this next round of snow. And um, that just, just, we're getting our final numbers in right now, we're demobiling our equipment, and we're at about 71 million. So we had practically no snow, and we've spent probably over $70 million just in, um, you know, mobilizing. We mobilized about 20 times. We had a lot of little events, little ice storms, little snowstorms, like right before rush hour or during rush hour that, you know, we have to be ready to respond for. And those, you know, even those little storms, you know, um, you know, cost us money. So, uh, so you all know that. Um, we've got about 4,500 pieces of equipment. Um, most of it is contracted. I, I would say I think we're around 300 pieces, maybe state equipment. That's different across the state. Um, in more rural districts, they tend to have more of their own equipment. We've just phased out a lot of our own equipment up here. We've got a, a really good contracting base, and they come with with newer equipment um, in some cases, and and you know supplements our our workforce. This is that megadome I was talking about, actually. Um, but district-wide, we've got about 120,000 tons of salt and about 25,000 tons of sand on hand and uh, about 250,000 gallons of brine. And the brine I'll talk about a little later, but the brine is about 23% um, salt and 77% water, so it's mostly water. All right, and we inspect um, the contractor vehicles every season. So right now, I'm actually doing snow right now. <laughs> we went from one season into the next season. We're holding um, you know, contractor vendor meetings. We're going to be um, entering our contract period. Um, we, we let these um, temporary contracts, we call them M7Bs. We also do servant contracts. We have several contracting mechanisms to contract with contractors um, for their equipment. But we inspect every single piece of their equipment um, to make sure it's ready for the road and um, then hire them on board for the season. We've got, um, I think, over 626 snow maps. Um, actually, at this point, we're constantly developing them based on the roadways that we're inheriting. So just so you know, it's a very, very organized effort when we go um, and do snow operations. Our, con our vendors, our contractors, um, our roadway monitors, um, they need to know where they're going and what they're doing. Um, and a lot of times, you know, if it's a light storm, if it's like less than two inches, we don't even, you know, get into the subdivisions, which are kind of a lot of the blue, the blue roads you see up there. Um, but we do do the minor and major chemical routes, the more the gray roads, you know, the major roads we, we treat and, um, you know, make sure that they're safe. Mm -hmm. So I'm going to get into some of how we plan for winter. So we partner really, really well with the National Weather Service. We also have um, a, a statewide contract with a company called ITERIS that extrapolates a lot of the uh, winter weather information for us from multiple sources. And we've got, we have multiple conference calls. We kind of know what's coming, Ho hopefully a couple days in advance. Sometimes it's really quick. Sometimes a squall comes through. And I've gotten several calls from National Weather Service at 3 or 4 in the morning saying, oh, a squall's coming over the mountain in Loudoun you know, in like an hour and we're like, okay, we got, you know, we've got a couple trucks on hand. We, we go out there and, you know, we're ready to go. Um, we determine a mobilization plan um, and then work our plan. So we've got five levels of mobilization, level one through level five, level one being the lowest, level five being the highest. Level one might be something like, um, you know, um, 30 or 40 percent chance of snow and a dusting of some sort. So we got to have some sort of presence you know, to make sure it's not too slippery. Again, if it's going to be during rush hour, if it's going to be on a weekend, we kind of plan appropriately depending upon what we think the traffic demand is going to be. And then we've also been using, um, Brian, and I'll get the, into this a little later in the presentation, um, our research council has found it to be very effective. Again, the solution is 23% salt and 77% water, so mostly water in regards to helping, um, you know, prevent bonding of the, you know, snow or ice to the pavement initially, which helps us get out there and ultimately use less salt in, in treating it, um, if we can get out there quickly and, and scoop it up. Um, again, this is more about the pre-wetting or the pre-treating um, or anti-icing is another term for it. Um, we usually try to do it about temperatures are above 20 degrees and um, it, the, the forecast doesn't begin as rain because it, you know, washes away if the forecast begins as rain. So it's not ideal. So we try to apply it at about 20 degrees. And um, that's an ideal temperature. Uh, if it gets any lower, you know, it, it's not it's not ideal, but we can do it. If the if the sun's gonna, you know, hit the pavement and the temperature's gonna go up a little bit, um, we can do it a little less. But we don't like to. It's it's the most effective at the temperature. Um, 
Let's see. And again, I kind of went into the, you know, being most effective kind of that first hour into the storm. So it's effective for us because it, again, helps mitigate that bonding between the, you know, snow and the ice onto the roadway. So that first hour, if we've got trucks pre-staged, if we've done our brining, the trucks are out there and then, you know, the snow starts to fall and it accumulates enough so that we can push it or, you know, start treating it or cars are driving over it, then it's not going to stick to the pavement and we don't have as much to do. So that's kind of nice. It really helps us not have to put as much down or not have to push as much in the long run. So we've got over 2,100 lane miles of interstates and major roads, um, including bridges, ramps, and overpasses. And those are the ones that we focus on treatment with the anti-icing or the brining treatment. So we don't brine all the roadways, all of those 14,000 lane miles of roadways. We do not brine all those, okay? Although I have gotten many calls from residents, believe it or not, saying, why aren't you brining my subdivision sheet? And I'm sorry if you're one of them. Why aren't you, you know, why aren't you doing that for me? And we only, we were really calculated about what we what we brine, again, because we're, you know, environmentally conscious as well. So we, we only really brine, um, you know, about 2,000 miles of roadway. So we're not brining the entire district. And, um, you know, we're doing that on our major roads, our, you know, some of our primary thoroughfares and interstates. So I'm going to walk you through mobilization. So again, we, we're doing the weather with National Weather Service. We get our contractors on board, depending upon what level of mobilization we're going to be. And they report, they've got to load their trucks. So you can imagine with 4,500 trucks in a large storm, that's maximum, like level five plus storm. Um, it takes a long time to get all those trucks in. They're coming from everywhere. They're coming from Culpeper. They're coming potentially from Maryland. They're coming from everywhere. And we got to get them into our area headquarters. We got to check them in. We got to you know, verify all their information. We got to get them loaded out of one of our domes. And then we got to send them out on one of those snow maps to where they ultimately need to be. And again, if it's a rush hour storm, you know, evening or morning, we are trying to get them in overnight, stage them appropriately, because if our trucks aren't there, everybody's stuck in traffic regardless, right? So the trucks are gonna get stuck in traffic. So they have to be there to kind of be ready. If two or more inches are forecasted, um, residents may also see trucks being pre-staged in subdivisions as well. Um, we try to get them in subdivisions too to try to get started um, where we have the resources but the primaries and interstates are our concentration. So for small events, we start making these phone calls to contractors 12 to 18 hours in advance. Um, a lot of these contractors, you know, snow is not their primary job. They're just doing this on the side during winter time. So, you know, we do that inspection, we mount their, you know, plow, you know, it's soldered into their vehicle, um, but they still have to get their equipment that we inspected. They've got to get it to us. So it just, it takes a while sometimes to, to get them, you know, get the process going. So 12 to 18 hours, and then large events, 18 to 24. Again, that's just a lot of equipment we got to get in, and then we got to load them each, just like this, either with a dump truck or with a conveyor belt. They've got to be loaded. Um, the conveyor takes, you know, it's a little faster with a conveyor on a Megadome. I think it's like, you know, two or four minutes. With this, it might be around five, five or six minutes. But it's, it's still a lot of time to load each truck. So we encourage folks to monitor the forecast along with us. You know, there's a lot of systems, a lot of apps out there now. People are, seem to be more aware of what's going on. Plan your grocery trips and stuff for before the storm hits. Um, plan to telework and adjust your commute. Again, stay off the road. Make sure you've got gas and, you know, hopefully you won't get stranded. Um, we also encourage folks to park in driveways or on one side of the street um, because that helps us ultimately, you know, plow better. And to be patient. And again, we've got some resources here. I know this presentation is going to be shared, so um, you can look at those at your leisure. Um, we've got an emergency website, so all of our Twitter feeds, if you're not, you know, a tweeter or a Twitterer, whatever they call it, um, you can actually just go onto that website and it'll show you, like, what we're tweeting, kind of the most up-to-date information. Um, the Twitter's at B-A-D-O-T Nova for updates. Um, 511, if you guys haven't checked out 511, I mean, I even use that when I'm going down 95 now to the beach or something, I call, uh, you know, 511 and I get the, you know, what's going on on 95. So that's, you know, that's available. And then v.plows.org. Um, we have AVL, which is the automatic vehicle locator um, system on all of our vehicles. And when we um, are mobilized at a level three and above, so we're doing plowing then because it's two inches um, or above at that point, um, we usually turn on the website. You know, people want to see what's going on when we're actually plowing. Okay, we have a lot of resources behind the scenes that, that work all these things. Um, our whole district, Marion, of course myself, um, about, you know, 760 employees. We, we all, well, actually I said 800, didn't I? I guess we've grown. Um, we've all, we all have an assignment during snow. So even the person in the, um, I don't know what's going on here. 
Should I say start meeting? I'll just exit out. There we go. Um, even the person who's a designer for their day-to-day -day life, they actually have a job during snow duty. They might be a roadway monitor. They might be working our call center. You know, So everybody in our district works snow. It's an all-hands-on-deck thing, 24-7 um, shifts until you know the traveling public is safe, until the roadways are, are sufficiently clear. All right, so I kind of went through this, what we work, interstate major roads, and then subdivisions, okay, in that order. Um, a lot of times we'll get into subdivisions and then we'll have to pull back out because there's an emergency on one of the other roadways um, where we called from an ambulance or something like that to, to go and assist. Um, again, interstates, you, most of you up here know what they are, high volume roads, um, 1, 7, 20, 8, 50, um, and they're made passable, um, not necessarily bare pavement. So you might not see, you know, blacktop, but they're made passable. This was this was a kind of a fun fun picture because this woman was like really really upset with us apparently, <laughs> and uh, we you know we showed up we talked her through some things you know we got to our street I mean I think it was a few days into that really bad blizzard in 2016 and she was really happy once we got there and we're able to you know at least make the roadway passable and everything I think they were out there shoveling it so um, you know it was it was a nice nice story um, when I say passable. Um, I mean an 8 to 10 foot path, which is enough for an emergency vehicle to get through, um, and it's drivable. So, you know, I get a lot of calls about this is, not, this is not good enough. You need to come back and you need to plow it more, you need to throw more material down, you need to do whatever. And, um, you know, it's passable. So traditionally, you know, we, that is okay. And again, we're not, you know, putting more material down or trying to scrape up the pavement. Um, you know, unless it's a like a hill or a curve or some other situation like that. But um, if an ambulance can pass it, pass through it, then that's sufficient. Some areas we are able to get curve to curve. Some areas we are able to do a little bit better. Um, but it just depends on the width and everything like that. Um, again, our goals for for things being um, passable. With a smaller snowstorm, obviously that's less time. We have a tremendous inventory. 14,000 lane miles is like four trips to California and back. That's how much inventory we have. It is huge. So, you know, we, we just can't, even with over 4,000 trucks, you know, get it all done in 24 hours if it's a huge storm. So just to give you some perspective. Um, again, one pass for typical storms. Um, we do some multiple passes for major storms. We try to do our hills and our curves and intersections. Um, yeah, we apologize for any mailboxes that we might hit, and uh, you know we try to avoid the fire hydrants. Um, you know, but we do appreciate assistance, folks. You know, digging those out so that we can see them, and um, you know, like I said, parking on one side of the road or you know, in your driveways and things like that. That's very helpful for us to do a better job. Um, again, we're, we're all about safety. We're all about the safety and trying to make things safe. So we're hitting those interstates and primaries really hard. Um, we'll go back and do the shoulders, the ramps, the turn lanes, the intersections. Uh, I get calls all the time about, oh, well, you got the road, but you forgot the turn lane or you forgot this. You know, and it's usually like a few hours into the storm, but we're going to go back and we're going to get to it. Um, you know, and, and in some cases, we do forget roadways. That's why you know, we want to hear from folks a couple days after the storm. You know, hey, you forgot my roadway. Well, you know, yeah, maybe I did forget it if it's you know, two days after a storm. But if it's within the first 24 hours or so, you know, we're, still, we're still getting around, depending upon how, how large it is. Is. And we also, you know, plow our park and ride lots. That's about 12,000 parking spaces. So again, our staff inspects. Um, you know, we've got about 140 monitors, roadway monitors that are, you know, part of our Northern Virginia district. Um, they inspect all those maps, you know, that you saw earlier. Um, they, are, you know, answer the phone sometimes. Um, our monitors actually mark the maps complete once every route has been checked, and it's a passable route. So again, you might see white top, you might, might not be curb to curb, but if an ambulance can traverse it, then it's considered passable. And we also have that automatic vehicle locator, which is that AVL, which um, we can help you know, use to verify where the truck has been and you know, where they are and things like that. The technology is still being developed. It's not as sophisticated as we would like um, you know, yet, but we're working on that. Um, we uh, typically do not um, you know, do sidewalks and trails. Um, that would be an additional inventory um, and, um, 
you know, just operation for us in terms of material, in terms of equipment, and we, we don't typically do them. Now, if we do get a phone call or if we know a resident that has, um, you know, a disability or an ADA issue, we do go back and we do maybe that portion or we partner with the schools, um, Fairfax County, Loudoun County, Prince William County, and um, their teams and us, you know, they, they will assist with school um, areas and things like that. But we typically don't go back and do you know, any sort of sidewalk, trail work and things like that, because we just have such a large roadway inventory. And you can imagine, again, with the, again, we're talking about materials here, you know, that's just more salt, more things that we'd have to put on there to, um, you know, so we, we let Mother Nature take care of those usually unless there's a specific case. And then we ask residents to, to be mindful of their areas, um, to clear near their property, to help others out, and of course, ask businesses to do the same. And depending upon your locality, there might be an ordinance regarding like uh, to require sidewalk snow removal or to require things like that. So that's um, something more local that you'll have to look into. And then after the storm, for your awareness, our demobilization takes hours. It's not like poof, we're done, right? We've got to take all of the stuff that was loaded and not used and we actually spin it off every single truck and we put it back. So we put it back in the domes um, to get reused, you know, for another storm. So we, and that material is accounted for, um, you know, in and out so that we have a, you know, calculated inventory. And Marion's going to talk to you a little bit about some of the things we have within our area headquarters. Um, we have underground storage tanks. We have different things that capture any sort of runoff that might occur from some of these materials that we've been using. Okay, i got to run through this because I'm running out of time. Get in the hand. <laughs> All right. So let me just go. So again, um, you know, here's some more information, myv.virginia.gov, 1-800-4-ROAD, anything you all want to report, not just snow. You got a pothole you want to tell us about, um, you know, any, any sort of issue, you can call that number 24-7, weekends, 2 o'clock in the morning, it's answered by somebody, okay? And again, I appreciate your patience when it comes to um, reporting roadways. So we're going to go through that, and I'm going to let Marian do hers, because I know we're running out of time, so I apologize. I was just having way too much fun with you all. There you go. Thank you. All right. Thank you, Lauren. And thanks to DEQ for inviting us here. I'm just going to go over quickly some of the best management practices we have in place currently um, for our salt management. Uh, BDOT is a regulated MS4, so Municipal Separate Storm Sewer System. We've got a permit issued from DEQ. We report to them annually. Um, and we're also subject to inspection by DEQ. So the MS4 is basically the system of inlets, pipes, channels along the VDOT roadway that's in the census urbanized area. So it includes all the storm network, for example, in the Akatink watershed. And uh, we are to control pollutants from entering that storm sewer system and then exiting into our streams and drinking reservoirs and such. So our MS4 permit is pretty specific on what minimum control measures we need in place. Uh, one is at our VDOT facilities or our area headquarters where all our salt is stored. Every one of those area headquarters within the MS4, they have a stormwater pollution prevention plan. So that's a document or a guide that says exactly what controls they need to be implementing on site. In addition to that, uh, those sites are inspected by the superintendent once a month. And then also annually, we hire a consultant to come out and do an assessment of our facilities. Uh, in addition to that, we also have the illicit discharge and detection and elimination system. So that is basically an illicit discharge is anything that goes into our storm sewer system that's not composed entirely of storm water. So we want to stop those pollutants from entering our system. And that includes, for example, for salt, if there's a pile of salt on a road, and it's raining and that salt's going into our storm drain, that's an illicit discharge. So that's something we want to know about so we can go out there, respond right away, and clean up that, that salt pile. Okay, so salt storage. Our area headquarters, that's where we store all our salt. Um, there's, there may be one or two in the Akatink watershed. I'm not 100% sure, but um, we do have area headquarters that um, service the roads in the uh, Akatink watershed, but all our salt is stored undercover. So that minimizes exposure to storm water. In addition yeah. to, for the salt to be undercover, also underneath there is an impervious liner. So both in the dome and then in a mixing pad, water cannot go 
into the ground. So we're concerned about infiltration and also surface runoff. So we want to minimize both of those things. So the way we achieve that is by storing all our salt undercover in a building, a dome. Um, and those domes have doors, salts contained in there. So also, in addition to salt, we've got our liquid products. So that's, for example, brine or magnesium chloride. And that is stored um, with secondary containment. So double wall tanks, berms, um, concrete containment around the, the containers. OK, so then what happens when that product is brought outside of the dome? So we have mixing pads, which are impervious. There's an asphalt berm to contain that area. All that water is captured on the mixing pad, and it's brought to a, either a salt pond or an underground salt tank. So I've got two pictures of salt ponds. Those are surface ponds, um, impervious liner, and those are zero discharge ponds. And what's better than that, the picture on the left at the top, it just looks like pavement. And what's underneath that pavement are underground storage tanks. So runoff from the mixing pads will go into the underground storage tanks. And that is um, a better best management practice than the surface ponds. It's more contained. We don't have to worry about thunderstorms or, or anything overtopping. So there is a movement to move away from the salt ponds and go to the underground storage tanks. And um, another thing we do is all our salting equipment, so the spreaders, the plows, after the event, those are brought back to the mixing pad and hosed off. And then that water, that wash water, goes down the drain and either goes to the salt pond or the underground salt tank. And all that is contained. So those are kind of some of the practices we have at our area headquarters. And it's easy to manage our salt there because we don't have to worry about the delicate balance between public safety and the environment. You know, we can, we can have control over the salt there pretty easily. OK, and that's what I got. <laughs> Thank you. And I just had a couple of slides. Um, our um, friends at the Research Council, I asked them to, because I thought you all might have some questions about, oh, I'm caught here. Um, Dr. Fitch, I, I think you, you, I think Annie, you might know him. Yeah, I think you guys are colleagues. So um, he's done some research. And I won't read through this. I'll let you all do that later, because I know we're short on time. But there are several links to studies um, in regards to bonding of ice on pavement, pre-wetting, um, stormwater runoff, um, lots of things, with links to each study, because I thought you all might find that of interest. Um, and ultimately, um, the state, Virginia as a whole, um, likes using brine for these reasons. Um, it significantly reduces our sodium chloride needed to achieve an equivalent level of service um, by preventing the formation of a bond between the ice and snow and pavement, like I talked about earlier. It allows a more complete uh, mechanical removal. You know, by plowing, I scoop it off, and then you know we can treat it, and the roadway from there is more manageable. Depending on a number of variables, including um, storm duration, temperature, precipitation, intensity, this practice can reduce, and this is a really nice bullet, um, sodium chloride application volumes needed for a given storm by 30 to 65 percent. So um, the reason why we do a lot of pre-rating or brine is because it does help us in the long run. I don't have to, you know, dump as much salt on the roadway to get the, you know, uh, snow and ice to melt. If I've done it beforehand and it's not bonding, then I just scoop it off and continue to treat. Um, it's, I think, also worth mentioning that, um, you know, around, you know, the nation, you know, Mary and I have looked up different studies, and also I spoke with Dr. French this morning, and um, most, most places, even internationally, I guess Canada, it, it all kind of comes back to, to salt. Um, you know, salt is effective, it's economical. And, um, you know, I, I actually asked him a little bit about beet juice. I'm like, I think I'm going to get some questions on beet juice. And, um, you know, at the end of the day, that he, he informed me that, you know, um, that beet juice also has to have a component of sodium chloride in it, an additive, to help it to be effective. So there are, there might be some folks, um, you know, using beet juice in a smaller concentrated setting. Um, but then he reminded me of the biology of that and the breakdown of the biology and how, and again, I'm not a scientist, so maybe Andy can interject, but, um, you know, the bi this is a chemical, so it breaks down a little different than the biological components, and the biological components, you know, in a stream and different things ha have different repercussions than salt. So, um, again, I'm not a scientist, so I'm not going to get all, all into that, but um, I just thought it would be worth mentioning that, that almost everybody uses salt. Well, and, the yes. Oh, good, good, good. Oh, this one. 
the environmental implication. Oh, okay. So this one has some beet juice information on it if you guys are interested in that. And we're always looking for ways to do business better. We're always looking for ways to keep the public safe and also have the treatment be effective. So, you know, we want there to be a balance, um, you know, and this is an exciting opportunity to work with you all um, in DEQ to try to find, you know, that balance. Um, in Northern Virginia, I forget how many tens of millions of dollars um, it is, but if, if the federal government shuts down and people can't get into D.C., it is tens of millions of dollars, which is, you know, the other reason why, you know, there's a lot of um, pressure, you know, for all of us to um, help make the roadway safe and to do, you know, what's economical and, and right to, to have that happen. So I, I'm, we're over time, so I apologize. So we actually, um, we have a contract and they scoop that up, the sediment up, and they take it to an appropriate discharge, usually a landfill, right? Or, oh, no, it actually goes to um, the facility. Oh, even better. Yeah, it gets pumped, it's either pumped and hauled um, uh, through a contractor or pumped directly into a, a, a newer vehicle, and we pay to, to discharge that. Mm -hmm. And for, for others, we'll try and quickly repeat the question. That question was about what happens to the collected runoff. Yeah, and also we, um, I think we reuse some of the the brine as well. Yeah. It so we reuse some of it in the brine. So we, you know, it's, it's pretty effective. One of those studies actually talks about that too. Not all of it, but we do reuse some of it. All the way in the back, she had a question back there. Mm -hmm. Okay. Sure. Right. Yes, we do, and I remember that because Dave contacted us on that. Mm -hmm. um, we, we, you know, you're always welcome to to call the one eight hundred four road number because we can get it to people pretty quickly. I mean, it goes right to our maintenance crews. Um, we went back and looked, you know, at our AVL to see who was there. Um, it was tough to verify if it was one of our contractors or somebody else. A lot of times, I get a call about a contractor. Are we, were you sure it's one of our contractors? Yeah, so it could have been if it it could have been a, another contractor being pre-staged for somebody else too. I'm not saying it wasn't ours, but we went ahead and cleaned it up because you know we're going to be friend we're going to be friends with everybody about it, and it's our roadway. But we end up cleaning up a lot of that stuff too. Sometimes it's ours, and sometimes it's not. But we went back and we cleaned it up. Um, you know, we tried to locate the contractor. We were not successful at, at doing that. So, um, but we our road monitors try. We try to have them you know go and look at the roadways afterwards and make sure that they're you know, not dumping or their sweaters aren't on accidentally and they don't know that, that, you know, it's there. So thank you for your vigilance and contacting us. More, and I think we'll have to cut it off to that. Just very brief, and uh, we will have time after lunch for panel discussion and can explore some things for the season story. I mean, I apologize if I missed this. Uh, for your underground salt storage, um, what's like the average capacity of one of those and what's the average So that, that varies from facility to facility. Um, every, every site's different. Some of them have very large tanks um, and more than one. So there's, um, I don't have a, a definitive answer for you and how that's calculated, but that's something I can look up if you're interested in later. Uh -huh. That's one we can follow up on. Yeah. We are with uh, the so we'll always do a panel. Okay, so we'll hold off on that. Thank you very much.